Okay. I don't have any fancy uh, PowerPoint, <clears throat> but I took a bunch of notes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because uh, I guess my role here is to discuss a little bit about the archaeology of uh, Whedon Island. Um, first of all, I kind of want to give a little background about my um, history with Wheaton Island. I did grow up here in St. Petersburg. My family moved here in the early 1950s when I was about three, so I consider myself pretty much a, a native of the area. But I didn't really get interested in archaeology until relatively late, um, probably in my early 20s. Uh, and uh, I won't go into some of the sordid details of uh, how I got interested in archaeology, but one of the things I did was uh, to go out and uh, walk around Wheaton Island. Of course, having read about the archaeology of Florida, I knew that Wheaton Island was a very important site. And of course, I wanted to see it. <clears throat> it wasn't uh, real easy to get in back then, uh, although it was easier than it is today because of all the security that they have around the uh, Progress Energy plant. <clears throat> so we managed to find creative ways to get in to see the uh, to, to walk around the middens and, and see what was going on back there. Uh, mostly I went out there to go fishing in the, in the uh, mosquito canals and canoeing uh, around uh, the various islands out there. But of course we obviously knew there was archaeological sites there. We did pick up a few shirts here and there. Um, and I uh, then went on to, well, step back. Uh, at that time I was uh, at uh, uh, what was then St. Pete Junior College, and now St. Pete College, and um, became more and more interested in archaeology and uh, took a, I think it was an adult education class that was taught by Frank Bushnell, who's sitting here in the front. Frank, stand up and let him see you. <laughs> Frank was, Frank was, uh, <laughs> Frank was my uh, biology teacher, and I failed his class miserably, but I, not because of Frank, but because I was not a good student <laughs> in biology. Um, however, I think I did pretty well in his archaeology class because he was very inspiring and, and had a great enthusiasm for the archaeology of Florida, and really, um, that's kind of what pushed me over the edge to want to try and learn more about archaeology beyond just um, the artifacts, which was what I was interested in then. You know, I would go out into the orange groves in, in Hillsborough County and look for arrowheads and things like that. So that kind of got me interested in um, learning more about the people uh, of behind the artifacts. It took me a while, but I finally uh, ended up going over to USF and um, was luckily uh, kind of put under the wing of Dr. Ray Williams over there, who um, encouraged me to um, continue my interest. Even though I had a BA in English Lit, um, I obviously wasn't doing any work in English Lit at the time, and uh, thought that maybe I could make a career out of archaeology. And as it turned out, um, I, was, um, I was successful in doing that. And um, so uh, I think the folks at USF also um, were extremely helpful in getting me um, <coughs> Uh, in that direction and becoming legit, so to speak. Um, anyway, I, I basically got involved in the private sector archaeology business and have done, did work all over Florida, other parts of the southeast, a little bit out west. Kind of got away from the St. Pete area for a while, but um, I guess uh, had always had this interest in Wheaton Island and in the archaeology of Pinellas County and um, the Tampa Bay area, and I guess it was back when. When was the uh, when, when what year did we start revising the museum in the early 2000s? Something like that, the J thing. Right. I think it was in the early 2000s, and uh, Phyllis and uh, Sheila Stewart and um, all of those folks who had who were working here um, asked if I would be um, on this little committee that initially was to. Uh, provide input for uh, kind of an updated um, display in, uh, in the center here. And that evolved into a organization that we uh, developed called the Alliance for Wheaton Island um, Archaeological Research and Education, or AWARE as we, as we call it for short. 
which is um, kind of carrying on or hoping to um, uh, go beyond some of the archaeology that's been done here in the past by focusing not just arche but, uh, about archaeology on Wheaton Island, but on Wheaton Island related archaeology throughout the Tampa Bay area, even up the coast of Florida. Um, and, uh, uh, and so that has been a main focus of my involvement here has been working with AWARE to um, uh, realize that. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've accomplished uh, in a few minutes. <clears throat> but basically, the archaeology of, of Wheaton Island, I'm sure locals had, had known about the um, middens and mounds out here for quite some time, but the, I think the first um, archaeologist who really um, documented and wrote up uh, Wheaton Island was a man by the name of S.T. Walker, who came out here, I believe, in the 1880s. Um, he actually documented a bunch of sites here in Pinellas County, and, and um, Wheaton Island was one of them. Um, he didn't do an enormous amount of digging, but he, he was very instrumental in identifying uh, sand mounds and midden mounds and, and shell middens all around the Tampa Bay area, and um, was one of the first, I'd say, scholarly uh, uh, publications about Wheaton Island and the sites in this area. <coughs> There are, there are other uh, short uh, investigations of the sites in this area, but it wasn't until the 1920s, um, as Ellen mentioned, that the Smithsonian came down here and did an excavation primarily in the burial mound, but also in some of the midden areas. And it's the burial mound excavation that gets the most publicity about Wheaton Island, because as you saw, some of those really ornately decorated uh, Wheaton Island pots were somewhat unique. Uh, Fuchs recognized that they were extremely well made. Uh, they've often been called the epitome of the ceramic arts in the southeastern uh, Native American cultures. Um, and they were found in this burial mound context. And although Fuchs didn't uh, identify it as the Wheaton Island culture, uh, that came later with Gordon uh, Willie, another well-known archaeologist, it, is, it was, for a long time, considered basically the type site for this quote-unquote Wheaton Island culture because of this unique, very well-made uh, pottery that was found in the burial. Um, so after, uh, after uh, Fuchs excavated here uh, in the 20s, there really was a big gap in any kind of sustained professional archaeological research um, Gordon Willie, again, who was probably the dean of North American archaeology in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, uh, published a, an extremely influential book in 1949 about the archaeology of the Florida Gulf Coast. And in that, he tried to uh, impose some order on all the finds that had been accumulating since the early part of the century up to the time that he published that book. And in this area, he created a chronology. They didn't have radiocarbon dates back there, so basically created a chronology based on what we call relative dating, which means artifacts and, and other objects found at the bottom of a site date older than those at the top of the site, called the law of superposition. It's pretty, pretty easy to understand. Um, <laughs> And so based on this very relative uh, sequence of ceramic types, um, he developed a chronology for much of the Gulf Coast. In this area, he identified the Wheaton Island culture. Of course, again, not having radiocarbon dates, it was kind of a wild guess about the timing of this. Um, but he identified this Wheaton Island culture. But he also recognized that some of these uh, ornately decorated ceramics were also being found in the, in the northwest coast of Florida. Uh, he also knew enough about southeastern archaeology to know that they were also being found in uh, lower uh, Alabama and lower uh, Georgia. And he could see relationships stylistically and also in the, play, the way that these ornately uh, decorated ceramics were being found in burial mounds. Not so much in uh, living areas, although some of them were, but most of them were being found in burial mounds. So he realized this was kind of like, probably a kind of a burial phenomenon but since that's what we had the most data on, he constructed his uh, temporal uh, sequence of cultures based on the differences in style through time 
uh, but before we nail it and after, based on these ceramics that came from burial mounds. Well, that's all well and good, and his uh, chronology served pretty much as the standard. Uh, even when I got into college in the uh, early 1980s, we still used Willie's chronology to try if we found a site with these certain kinds of pottery in it, we knew, okay, well, this is a Wheaton Island site. Um, by that time, we had a few radiocarbon dates, and we were starting to be able to put these into some sort of um, time frame in terms of calendar dates, but we still didn't have a whole lot. Well, in the, only, the next excavation that occurred out here of any size was in the late 19, mid to late 1960s by William Sears, who was an archaeologist up at um, uh, what was then uh, the Florida State Museum and is now the Florida Museum of Natural History which is up at um, the University of Florida. And Sears excavated in an area where uh, transmission line and gas pipelines and all this kind of stuff were gonna go through part of the midden. And he excavated in the midden, close to the burial mound, but mostly in the midden. And what he found was is that the ceramics in the domestic area, a midden is basically an area where people discard the refuse of everyday life, you know, food remains, broken pottery shirts, broken tools. He found that the ceramics from there didn't look anything like the ceramics in the burial. Uh, they were plain, uh, sometimes had small amounts of uh, decoration, maybe check stamping, uh, but for the most part were very, very plain um, and didn't look anything like the, the ceremonial words in the, in the burial mounds. Um, and this got archaeologists to start thinking about, well, you know, what, why would there be such decorated ceramics and burial mounds, such plain utilitarian wares in domestic uh, context? And Sears came up with this idea of the sacred versus the secular. Whereas in, the, in, se in secular context, domestic context, you're going to be using your everyday wear. Just think about at home, when you're having dinner with your family, you've got your, your dishes that you use, but on special occasions, you know, you bring out the fancy wear. Well, something similar, although it wasn't, you know, related to meals so much, it was related to a very special event in those people's lives, which was the interment of the dead in burial mounds. So they, it was pretty quickly realized that, you know, there is a difference between the pottery and domestic pottery in uh, burial mounds, and also that uh, it might not be possible to date a domestic site based on pottery in a burial mound. Some of those ceramics may have been uh, curated over long periods of time. Uh, there was a lot of other uh, possibilities for why there might be differences in these things. So that set up a real uh, dichotomy that our more recent archaeologists have, have had to try and deal with. But really, that was the last major, major excavation that was done out here at Weedon Island, and Sears published that report in 1971. So that was quite a long time ago. So there's really only been two major excavations out here, one in the 1920s, one in the late 60s. Uh, since Sears, there have been some surveys for uh, Progress Energy, when they wanted to do some expansion. Uh, there have been some, uh, uh, there was a recent survey of the entire site complex by uh, a USF graduate student, Jonathan Dean, uh, that did produce some very interesting information on the entire site area. Um, and AWARE is in the process of trying to develop a long-term research plan for investigating the entire Wheaton Island site, not just the burial mound areas, which of course, as many of you know, because of various laws and concerns by Native Americans, it's much harder now, if not impossible, to excavate cemetery sites. In reality, however, my interest is, and I think a lot of archaeologists are interested, what went on in the day-to-day -day lives of the people who lived out here. Um, and we still obviously want to know something about their rituals, their customs, their, their uh, religions, their social and political systems. But in order to, to graph those two together, we need to know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis when people you know, did the stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Went out, got the food to eat, um, had to take care of their children, 
uh, had to contend with hurricanes, uh, had to contend with uh, years when uh, the when it was very rainy, years when it was very dry, years when there was a good harvest of shellfish, years when there wasn't a good harvest of shellfish. Um, they also had to contend with their neighbors. Um, for the most part, we think that they would, there was no major, major wars going on during that time period, but there was definitely raids, there was definitely animosities, there were definitely territories that uh, different groups had to defend. So you have an environmental situation that they had to adapt to, you had a, they had a social situation that you had to adapt to, and those are the kinds of questions that archaeologists today are trying to figure out. We've got more and more radiocarbon dates to kind of tie all this stuff down in time, so that's a help, and uh, we want to move beyond just trying to figure out, okay, well, they ate a lot of fish and shellfish, uh, they made a lot of pottery, uh, we want to learn some more about their social interactions, how the family life was, how they adapted to their environment. And that's what AWARE is really uh, set up to do. Uh, not only members of AWARE, uh, but also to try and get researchers who are interested in Wheaton Island and other uh, contemporaneous cultures in the southeast to come here and do research. Um, and so uh, that's our focus. We really have uh, a lot of people to thank for that, in addition to Phyllis and the people here at the Wheaton Island Center. Uh, the Friends of Wheaton Island also were instrumental in helping us excavate the um, dugout canoe that you've heard uh, talked about. And also, I want to make, I want to uh, also point out the individual who found the canoe, I think he's still here, Harry Corrin, are you here? Stand up, Harry. This, this guy had, needs to be recognized because Harry found his canoe. <laughs> Harry found his canoe back in 2001. And, um, you know, he could have excavated it, taken it home, displayed it to his friends, but he did not. He came to Phyllis and told him, told her what he had found, had photographs, had videotapes, and he is really the person who is most responsible for us being able to get this out of the ground into a preservation tank and hopefully uh, on display here uh, in a year or so once the preservation process is done. If it wasn't for Harry, um, it never would have happened. Despite all everybody else's contributions of funds and labor, if he hadn't come forward, we would never have we would never have that resource here. So um, he deserves a, a, a lot of credit. So thanks, Harry. Um, so, so AWARE is moving forward, uh, Wheaton Island Research is moving forward, um, I think it's an exciting time, I think the fact that Wheaton Island, even though it's considered the type site of the Wheaton Island culture, it's really on the periphery of what we now know was the Wheaton Island uh, area of influence, uh, Wheaton Island we believe really started up in uh, southern Alabama, southern Georgia, and north Florida, and expanded down into the peninsula part of Florida along the coast as far down as Charlotte Harbor. So really, it's kind of a, a ironic that Wheaton Island was the first site that this was identified at, and yet it's kind of an anomaly. It's on the periphery. It doesn't have a lot of the classic um, uh, features that Wheaton Island sites in the heartland do. Uh, but on the other hand, that also makes it really interesting to um, study because it doesn't have those. How does it differ? Why does it differ? How did it interrelate with these core Wheaton Island groups? And so we're very excited about um, the future of AWARE and the future of Wheaton Island. And um, thank everybody who has helped um, not only the center, but also to get AWARE and these research opportunities off the ground. Thanks. reminded me that on uh, March, if, if, uh, if you don't know, is Archaeology Month in Florida. And uh, this year on March 3rd, thank you, March 3rd, uh, we're having Archaeology Day out here. Uh, we're going to have, uh, there is a spot uh, nearby where uh, when county employees were putting in a fence, um, they encountered this big uh, deposit of lithics. In other words, 
remains from making stone tools, some cores, um, and some other stone tools. They found it in this post hole, and what we want to do is go back and do a small excavation there to see exactly what that entails, whether it's a, just a small deposit or whether there's a really large deposit. So um, on that day, we're having people come out. You can come out either on tour to see what we're doing, or you can volunteer to help with us on that day. Um, so put that on your calendar if you're interested in volunteering. We'll be meeting here at um, 10 o'clock, and we'll go out to the site, and you can get your hands dirty or just watch and take pictures, ask questions, sift through sand, look for artifacts, and participate in a real archaeological excavation. So, thanks. Okay, before um, we do some audience participation, I want to take this opportunity to um, make another acknowledgement. A lot of what happens here also comes from donations that are made from corporate partners, and we have two outstanding ones that we want to recognize. One is uh, Derby Lane, who from 1992 through 2012, and Florida Power through 1992 through 2012, were platinum uh, partners, which means that their corporations have donated more than a thousand dollars each and cheap. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I want to open this up to the audience, and I know we've heard a lot about different things, but I'd love to hear about the oyster farm that we're here. Randy, would you tell us about that? You want to come up here? <laughs> This is Dr. Randy Harding, uh, and uh, he'll tell you about his uh, history uh, that comes back to Wheaton Island. I'm um, R.C. Harding. My sister Joyce Kripendorf is in the back, and we were both born and raised in St. Petersburg. won't tell you the years, but... <laughs> uh, my grandfather, Thomas Harding, I'm not sure where he was born and raised, but or where he's born, but he was uh, born in 1864, and he was a uh, ship's captain. He would uh, haul freight and cargo from, uh, from St. Petersburg, Tampa area, to uh, Central America, Costa Rica, that, that, that area. Then he would, some, at some point in time, he settled in St. Petersburg, but I'm not real sure. Uh, he married my grandmother, Minnie Connell, who was born and raised in Floral City. And how she ended up in St. Petersburg, we're not really quite certain either. But ne nevertheless, sometime in uh, probably around the turn of the century, they were married, maybe their early teens. Uh, and my grandfather also had a brother, um, we called him Uncle Dick, Dick Harding. He, was, he lived out on the beaches, and I really don't know much about him other than that he was just an old cracker fisherman that uh, you know was about that big around and brown as that carpet so um, sometime and again I'm not sure of these dates either but sometime sometime probably in the um, late 20s maybe maybe even the uh, late teens my grandfather Thomas started uh, an oyster house out on Weed Island out by the bridge on the south side of the bridge and um, he ran that until he passed away, and in the early 30s, my father joined him, and they ran the oyster house out on Wheaton Island, and they would sell uh, oysters on a half shell, uh, bushel of oysters, uh, uh, you know, oysters, they clean oysters, some other quarter of the pint. And uh, at one time, they opened a little store in downtown St. Petersburg on 9th Street North around 3rd Avenue, across the old Chevrolet or where Coney Island is in that area, if you remember where that is. Uh, they had a little business down there that had uh, a cooler with, uh, they would bring the oysters down into the city and they would sell, again, sell oysters in the half shell or by the bushel or by the court. And uh, my sister remembers going down there and kind of hanging out with them, I guess, a little bit when she was little, six or seven years old. and. Um, they would uh, they would chuck the oysters out when they when they uh, my grandfather had leased the rights and my father they leased the rights the oystering rights from the state of Florida and they would have 
their oyster beds out in the flats out off of uh, Weed Island, and Pappas Bayou. And uh, I don't know, there were other men, other oyster men that would, would do the same thing. I don't know if they used my grandfather and father's oyster house to have their oysters clean or exactly how that worked. But they were, it was kind of a community of oyster men that, that uh, worked you know, the oyster beds out in this area. Uh, and then my dad continued to operate the oyster house after my grandfather died until um, World War II. And, you know, they obviously weren't making a lot of money, but uh, he, he ended up working as a fireman at Drew Field, which is now in Tampa, in Hillsborough County, which is now over near where the airport is now, and the Hillsborough Community College in that area. And he, he worked there as they, they would train uh, pilots. They were uh, pilots being trained for you know, fights and during the war. And he worked there as a fireman uh, as the uh, pilots would often frequently crash their planes. And uh, he did that until after the war. And when he did, he had a couple of people that worked for him. Their name uh, was Johnny and Flora. And I don't remember the last name. I saw it out on the... You know, but Johnny and Flora, he, they worked for him, and he just kind of turned it over to them to run the oyster house while he was uh, doing the fireman thing. And um, after the war, he came back, and he basically uh, turned the business over, quote, unquote, sold the business to Johnny and Flora. And that was probably in the late 40s. Uh, I'm not sure of the date of that either as well. But... Um, he, uh, there's no value to it, so basically he just turned the lease rights over to them. But he would, he maintained contact with them, and I remember as a kid, we would frequently come out, or frequently maybe three or four times a year, and come out and visit Johnny and Floor and see some of the other activities on that, on the Weed Island. I, the thing I remember about was the uh, airport hangar where they kept all the floats. Uh, I don't remember the air field or, other things than that that were brought up, but I do remember the floats where they were kept. And we would come out and uh, visit Johnny and Flora, and we would often go crabbing, and we would wait around out in the flats, and we would uh, take a like a big wash tub, number five type wash tub, and tie it to our waist, you know, with a rope, and we'd wait out there in the tub to float behind us, and we'd catch oysters. We many times, I just thought it was routine. We would fill the tub with blue, you know, blue. Uh, blue crab oysters, I mean crab, blue crabs. And then we'd take them home and my mom would clean them and boil them, cook them and they would sit up and they'd clean the oysters and as fast as my mother would clean them, my dad would eat them and she'd get mad at him and she'd swat him for paper or something, you know, and he'd just laugh about it. And kind of the, the ironic part about that is, is that he, uh, after my father passed away, my wife and I, we would take my mom out for dinner, and we, she would always, very often, order crab cakes. And, because uh, she loved crab cakes, and my mom and dad both loved crab cakes. But when we take her out to dinner for the crab cakes, she'd always complain that we never had enough crab. You know? <laughs> but another story that's not documented, and I don't know if it's true or if it's just been embellished or exaggerated or whatever, but my dad, uh, there were some other oystermen that worked out here. And um, one, of the, one of his friends after the war was named Johnny, and he approached my dad about, let's get out of the oyster business and let's go do something else. And uh, my dad, yeah, he was thinking about getting out. He was going to turn it over to Johnny and Floor, and he was going to get into dry cleaning, and which he did. And the other guy decided to open a restaurant, and which he did. And his name was uh, Johnny Lebron. <laughs> I think that's true, but I'm not real sure. But, uh, anyway, that's kind of my connection with Weed Island. I don't remember the last time I saw the Oyster House. It was probably when I, I was in high school, you know, in the mid-60s, early 60s. We used to ride out here and do a lot of the things that uh, were described earlier, <laughs> whatever we could do to get in trouble. But um, I remember seeing it then, and I guess I don't know when it was tore down or... Um, yeah, I guess the bridge is still intact too. We used to go over that, and I guess that burned down after I left. So, uh, anyway, that's my connection to Weed Island. I kind of wish 
now in hindsight that I've had uh, paid a little more attention to what was going on because it's quite an interesting place and has quite a history. So, and thank everybody for coming out and uh, supporting this good cause. they'd like to tell. Frank? Bob had already introduced me as Frank Bushman. I got started in archaeology as a child. I'm from the land originally. My family came down. My great-grandfather was a soldier in the Second Seminole War. And when the war ended and Florida opened up for homesteading in 1845, he homesteaded in three sections of land in the Mosquito County. Because that's the Volusia County now. He was a cattleman, an agent for the Confederate government, and amassed quite a large fortune selling cattle with the Confederate army. But bringing up the time, the first artifact I ever found, I was seven years old, I was walking down a shell road going to Boston Avenue Elementary School into land and found a beautiful clay plummet, which I still have. That started me off. I served in the Korean War when I came back, I started under Stetson. And uh, was under the tutelage of a Dr. Ezra Allen, who was a Nobel nominee in chemistry. But his love was archaeology. And he's the one that taught me as a man, young man in my 20s, not to just collect arrowheads, but to record everything that I thought of, to study why they made it, how they made it. My grandmother, by the way, used to take my brother and I camping on the St. John's River on Indian Mounds. So that probably really got us started digging. And you got to remember that when I was actively working in the field, there were no laws governing it. The basic idea was if the burial mound belonged to a tribe which no longer existed, it was fair game. Throughout the time I've dug from Fort Walkland to Marathon, and from Daytona to Marathon, from the St. John's River from Lake Harney to Palatka, and uh, I think I've recorded over 100 sites that I've excavated. To bring us back to Wheaton Island, I didn't really dig here, but I was in 1958 wandering around. I was teaching then, I started teaching at Bocasiega. And uh, it was easy to get into the burial mound. There was a dirt road that ran from just south of the guard building. It went into the mound. One day I was there, and there was a likely spot because I realized that Fuchs and a lot of the other, even more recent ones, spent all their time digging in the mound proper. They didn't worry about the fringe of the mound. Quite often the caches are in the fringe. Well, I started a trench that was nine feet long, five feet wide, and four feet deep. I didn't find anything, really. But while I was in the bottom of the trench, I smelled vinegar. Being a biology major, I knew what it was. So I was looking around the wall of the trench, and right above my left shoulder, a whiptail scorpion that must have been eight inches long came tumbling out and landed on my left shoulder. <laughs> and of course, even though they don't sting, it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> I brushed that off, and I filled up the trench. And as I was walking out, I had a feeling that there was someone following along in the woods watching me of being a big talker and liking people, I stopped and I turned around and walked right to where I'd seen him. And I met a gentleman, almost like a mountain man. And I didn't know who he was. He introduced himself and I introduced myself. And we visited for a while and he invited me over to his shack, which was on Ross Island. And he was known as the Hermit of Ross Island. And I've often wondered if I could find someone that knew the man. And in Shack, he had quite a nice library of technical books on fishing and hunting. And seemed a very, very likable person. And this reminds me of speaking of books. 
One of my favorite passages comes from Stephen Vincent Bonnet's book, John Brown's Body, where he says, one who goes searching for the wandering stone should not bear, marry, or beget. Well, I've been married twice, and I still have the wandering stone. <laughs> Dangers involved, by the way. I was doing a dig with Ripley Bullen down at the Englewood School Mount, which no longer exists. And we were down at the bottom of a pit that must have been six feet deep, about eight feet square, steep-sided. I took a GI shovel, the old Korean War issue one, and I dug a hole in the bottom of that shell bed and opened up a huge yellow jacket's nest. <laughs> and oh, did we get it. I finally got out of the pit, went up to my car, which was an old woods car, and went blind. So he told me, and I knew, just lie down on the ground and prop your feet up on the running board. And that passed after a while. On another trip, I got struck in the leg with an oxen. Fortunately, my, you would think this is great. I was out digging, Sands Elvis Presley. Blue suede shoes, gray flannel pants, and a blue sport jacket. <laughs> and the flannel pants were thick enough that it stopped the oxen's fangs. <coughs> then I was looking at another one on Highland Park Dead River west of the land. The water was high. So I, pull, I tied my anchor rope around my waist and was pulling the boat through the swamp using machete to cut the vines. I hit the blade into the water and it ricocheted and hit me right in the tibia and stuck. <laughs> so I guess the moral of the story is it may be a lot of fun to get out there, but be careful. <laughs> started, Barbara Todd was really instrumental in it, and I was wondering if you would tell the people the story about when we had the public hearing at Northeast High School. You tell you, Well, there was a newspaper article, and it was just beginning, like 1988, we had a big meeting at Florida Power, they hosted this, and then the, the gentleman was on our board, I forget his name, but he was... Uh, he was one of the editors at the time, so they put an article in the paper about what we were trying to do. And we were going to have a public hearing of what should happen to Wheaton Island. And they said it would be at Northeast High School in the auditorium. And we didn't know how many environmentalists were around or anything. And the crowd that showed up that night, there was not enough seats in Northeast High School to see everybody. And I just thought people didn't know. In that, that time and that period, people were still in, were involved in the environment, but they hadn't spoken out. And they came out, and they packed that place. And I just thought that was one of the things that really got us started, is when the public came to pack us. Thank you. And thank you, Tom. Uh, I don't particularly have anything prepared at all, but I would just like to say that uh, as the architect of this building, we were, uh, feel very blessed and privileged and thank Dickley Parker for the, the light that got it going from our view from the county, uh, because you're the one that actually hired us via Jake. Jake Stowers, I'm sorry, he's not here. He was, he was wonderful as a, as a leader in making this mission happen. Uh, one of the unusual things about this building, though, is that it's that the design and the construction all happened in less than one year, which is very unusual for a county project, and, uh, or any government project, for that matter. And, uh, we, we also did, whoops, we also did Burger Creek, and that one took probably three times as long uh, in the overall picture. But anyway, so I was very appreciative of this. It, uh, just a couple little things about this building. Uh, the, uh, of course, 
we had several, and you know, we had a couple of very important workshops where we had a lot of people involved, a lot of some Native American representation. And uh, you know, something you probably already know about the cardinal points that are set up in the building, uh, and that that was very important. The four directions: the cardinal, north, east, south, west, but then also the spiritual on the ground, and then, and then above. Uh, which are a real theme of the building, but one of the challenges for us was that uh, they also thought it was very, very important to enter on the east side of the building. Uh, the parking lot was already uh, established right where it is, and so uh, we placed, when we ended up deciding this was the right place for the building, the parking lot is on the back side of the building. So it yeah, became an interesting, and actually what was a beneficial thing, uh, maybe you all have noticed it just intuitively, but the idea that you park and have to discover the front door uh, is, is really a part of, the, part of the joy of the building. At Burger Creek, we were able to uh, be able to take you for a mile uh, off of the highway and then, then a, a, a beautiful walk through the, whoops, through the swamp. Can't talk about my hands. <laughs> uh, through through the, uh, the salt, I mean, through the, uh, to the swamp, to the, the wetland, there to to the building uh, as a as a way of decompressing. So we had a very short time <laughs> to do that here before you get to the front door from the parking. So anyway, that that actually I think worked out fairly well. Um, I know we had some challenges. The uh, we had a tight construction budget. We uh, we pushed uh, and actually ended up uh, using the exhibit. I believe all the exhibit money to. Uh, or the, the bulk of it at the beginning to actually add the third floor uh, because we wanted uh, an observation point because uh, from this, you know, when you get up there, your, your panorama view is, is pretty, pretty wonderful. And we knew that we could, that exhibits will be coming, that's something we can always do. It's kind of like furniture in your house, but if you don't put the room up there, that wasn't going to probably ever happen. So uh, that, I think, has worked out pretty well. Again, it happened. Uh, very, very, very quickly. Uh, anyway, that's the, that's the architectural point. And again, I'm, I'm very privileged and, and grateful uh, to have been able to, to be part of this wonderful building and this whole mission. Yes? I, I want to mention that right at the beginning, we were lucky enough to have Billy Cypress, which is the head of the Seminole. Yes. He came up to all the meetings, the planning meetings, right. stayed at the hotel downtown Clearwater, and came to all the meetings and approved all the plans. Yeah, and you you did a great facility, and the Indians were 100 percent behind us. Good, thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. But what I really wanted to talk about, <laughs> which is a very everybody's been sitting a long time, but uh, my father, who uh, his grand his, my grandfather, his father was in 1913. Uh, one of the books though says I saw it says 1915. So I'm not sure if they were cheating or the books wrong, but. <laughs> Um, but anyway, my dad, he, he passed away at the height of the Depression, and, uh, and my, father, at the, my father was 12 when he passed away, and the, his friends at the Albert Whitted Airport kind of raised him because he grew up right next to Mountain Park Hospital, um, which actually, I'm, I was born in Mountain Park Hospital, I'm proud to say. <laughs> um, but anyway, he would, uh, so he was very involved in airplanes and aviation uh, at Albert Whitted, and but one of his missions was, uh, he would talk to me about Wheaton being so wonderful because he would, he was like 12 years old, <clears throat> 12, 15 years old, and they would, he would ride his bicycle from, you know, south side of St. Petersburg up here and uh, for the air shows because they would use him to uh, collect tickets, to sell tickets. And the reason they held these fabulous air shows here is because, as opposed to Albert Witted, is because they could collect money here because of the bridge. If you wanted to come see the air show, you saw all those cars in the picture. Well, they all had to come across, come across the bridge, so they had to pay. Whereas at Albert Witted, he said everybody would just be all over town and why spend any money to go onto the airport because you're, you know, you're a block away, so you could see the air show from a distance. Here you can do that. I thought that was kind of interesting. But he talked about. Um, some of the, the air events here, you, well, you saw Eastern Airlines, that was very, very serious uh, beginning. My dad was very involved in Florida aviation history. And, uh, 
But just one last point was that he saw a Ford trimotor at one of the air shows. You know, big Ford trimotor, the three engines, the old airplane. And uh, he, he saw it take off. He knew the pilot's name and all that. And unfortunately, I forgot and did not write it down. Very angry with myself. But anyway, on takeoff, you know, on the grass strip, he would take off, put one wing down and actually be rubbing in the grass on takeoff and then pull up and actually do a loop with this Ford trimotor uh, right there on takeoff. And, uh, you can see it. <laughs> I just want to break in and say that my mother flew with Tony Jellis. Yep. And, the, and the old thing, they gave some passenger rides. And as you know, that was the first commercial trip. Right. When they flew a ham and a newspaper across the bay, but there was daily traffic. The world's first airline was St. Peter. Right, absolutely. Yeah, my dad started the Florida Aviation side and flew that airplane, the replica that they built across the bay, and that was fun. But um, anyway, that's, that's all I want to say. It's just a wonderful spot. Thank you. This is Sheila Stewart and her husband. Very quickly, I just want to say um, hello. and. Um, I had the privilege of being the first manager here, though Phyllis has done a wonderful job in continuing on with this, and I worked with Barbara and Eddie and Tom and Billy Cypress and all those that helped to make the center what it is. And I want to say to you, I actually um, interviewed your father when I was 13 years old and became an archaeologist because of Major Robinson. Thank you. <laughs> I'm currently a teacher, and I teach gifted students. And I had brought them out here um, with the Gifted Magnet Program at Thurgood Marshall for a couple of years. And one of my students, uh, when we're talking about the future of Wheaton Island, one of my students wrote this nice little poem, and it spells out Wheaton Island. W, a whimsical, wonderful place. E, everybody loves everything. E, exactly the place I want to be. D, dugout canoes could be right around the corner. That was a prediction. That was before we found the dugout canoe. <laughs> oh, once Indians lived here. In, nothing could distract me. I, ignorant people see nothing, but I see everything. That's a middle, middle school student speaking. S, sounds work through my ears. L, land and sea meet here. A, an array of animals live here. In, nature is beauty in my eyes. D, dreams are what this place is. They can see it and they will continue to see it. And I would like to introduce my husband, who also brought a group of students out here for creative writing, um, to read a piece that they wrote. John. I can't remember whether it happened before I planned the trip or it helped to inspire me, but it must have been after I planned the trip because I said, you know, if we're lucky, we'll see Rosie at Spoonbills. And I looked out over the class, and it looked like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I said, how many of you know what a Rosie of Spoonbill is? And I think one hand went up. And at that point, I had an old Apple computer that was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> but on my desktop, I had a picture of two Rosie of Spoonbills in flight that I had taken. And so I went over and I yanked the cord, the, uh, the speaker wires out, and I picked it up and I turned it around and said, this is a roseate spoonbill, and we may see when I put it back down. So I brought about a dozen uh, creative writing students out here, um, and a lot of them said uh, in their writing that this is the first time they had seen Florida minus Walmart and Mickey and so forth. Um, the first surprise came when I stepped off the bus, one student wrote, I took my first breath of fresh air. <laughs> it smelled familiar. There have not been many times when I had not inhaled car exhaust, already eaten pizza, or some other odor, but there was none of that here. I felt a light breeze blow across my face, and I did not mind. It was clean. That's Thomas Greenlee. Thomas, if you're watching this at some point on television, nice work. Um, and I want to end with the, uh, a piece written by a student, uh, Megan Milanese, um, and this is appropriately as she's leaving. As, as I ed exit the education center, which was only built in 2002, the palm trees outside crackle as the wind blows again. 
It sounds like applause echoing from the 1920s when Wheaton Island was a studio with Buster Keaton making movies. Or maybe the plants are celebrating the fact that they are still here when so many other things have vanished from this place. They have outlasted Native American tribes, a dance pavilion called the San Remo Club, and later the Grand Central Airport. This entire area is a survivor. Thank you. I, I put, or I had a student actually today, put up all the work that you brought, Sh Sheila, on the walls uh, so people could see the, the words of these students. Well, I think now can we show the film clip, or is there anyone else pressing to speak? Okay, come up. <laughs> Very briefly, uh, my relation with Wheaton Island was as a young teenager. You know that means nothing good came of it. <laughs> I did write some articles, which I'll go into that, but there was something that we did that makes me grateful I wasn't part of the archaeological dig. Uh, you know the mosquitoes on Wheaton were biggest attack dogs. And, the tr and every once in a while, the, the fog machines would go out there. Our favorite thing to do, ride our bicycles in the fog. Oh. So, I'm here today and I'm not you. <laughs> if you do, Jane, Jane has written some wonderful stories about Wheaton Island. I think there's something called a snipe hunt. Oh, yes. So anyway, if you get a chance to um, read those. Um, Lisa? Well, go ahead and look. Okay. I'm Lisa Bradbury. Um, by day, I'm an administrative assistant, but in my spare time, I love to research films that were made in Florida, and this area is very interesting to me. Uh, I brought some clips today from two of the three films that were made here. Uh, Today, if you go to the entrance of where the power plant is, that's where the studio buildings were located. In 1933, um, there were three films made there. That was Chloe, Love is Calling You, Playthings of Desire, and The Hired Wife. Uh, there was an effort uh, by some residents in St. Petersburg to bring filmmaking to St. Petersburg during the Depression as a business proposition to boost the uh, local economy. Uh, Fred Blair, who is a member of the Chamber of Commerce, and he was also the developer of the Grand Central Airport here, uh, teamed up with a private investor named T.C. Parker, Jr. They were able to convince uh, a California movie producer by the name of Aubrey Kennedy uh, to come to Wheaton Island and refabricate the, the old empty San Remo Club into a production office. Then they proceeded to uh, build a sound stage and they produced the three films here. I'm going to show you the clips. And you might recognize that um, there were various locations most of Chloe was made out at Wheaton Island. There was a garden party scene coming up that was shot in Old Northeast at a home there. Uh, the second film, Hired Wife, takes place uh, at the train station downtown, the defunct Sereno Hotel, which is no longer there. Uh, the Grand Central Airport included a lot of scenes of that, so you can actually see the tower buildings that were right here near the spot where we are today and one of the mayor's homes. So I hope you enjoy these.
They kept saying that way, but I saw them was wrong and they were down. I remember that it's myself. But Danny told me all about it.
Down, a suite, two bedrooms and a living room. Thank you, sir. How about the seventh floor? Go right there, front. What are you doing in New York? Vivian, this is Philip Marlowe, the famous artist. He developed it to my wife. Your wife? Well, just a couple of honeymoon, you okay? All the best wishes in the world, Mrs. John. Thank you. Congratulations, Kent. Thanks, Phil. Are you stopping in the hotel? Yes. Give us a ring sometime. I'd be glad to. We'll see you later. Yes, indeed. Dear, I'm going to take you up in the cloud. Oh, but I... Now, now. You're not going to be afraid. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, don't take any tests, please. We just put this in out here. so serious. It's about Vivian. You're a friend of hers, aren't you? Well, I hope I am. Is there anything wrong with Mrs. Johns? She's terribly unhappy. You've got to help her. Unhappy? Why, I only just saw yes, her. Yes, but you didn't know that W. Johnson and her mother were in town. Well, how could that cause any, any unhappiness for Mrs. Johns? It's going to cause plenty. They're talking about Kent's marriage to Vivian. It's uh, an agreement. A contract. And at the end of the year, there's to be a divorce. Well, Pat, that's ridiculous. No, John. She's fine, sir. Alone. Mrs. John's what? Your wife went up in a plane alone. Yes? Yes? Well, she made a great takeoff, eh? <laughs> You did it deliberately, didn't you? It was a frame, wasn't it? Debbie, it had to be done. These two people love each other, and I'm very much interested in their happiness. Oh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my wife? Up there! <laughs> <laughs> She's crashing! <laughs> <laughs> 